many people think wrongly that spiritualism is about communicating with the dead. How can you communicate with the dead when there are no dead? How can you be a widow if your husband is alive and you can clairvoyantly see or clairsentiently feel your husband's presence? How can you be a widower if your wife is only a prayer away? And when you send a thought out to a relative, it can be a child, a neighbour, a friend who's taken that transition through that power of love, which you can't see, then we can have the wonderful, simple but profound truth you can only be alive temporarily with a physical body, but you're also alive spiritually forever. And it doesn't matter what color of skin you have, it doesn't matter what country you're born in, it doesn't matter whether you call yourself a Christian, a Jew, a Hindu, an agnostic, an atheist, or anything else. You live forever. And one of the privileges that I've had in my life is getting to know people. Young people, so-called elderly people, all shades, all kinds. And I believe that within each and every one of you here this morning, there's an infinite spark which we call the divine, God, and that that God is unique to you, and it manifests itself in the most amazing ways. And I'll briefly tell you about a wonderful human being who I met several years ago, a total stranger. Some of you may have heard about a group called the Proclaimers. I was born and brought up in the Kingdom of Fife in Scotland, which is a small place in a town called Methil, M-E-T-H-I-L, which most people even in Britain have never heard of. <laughs> the Proclaimers are two twin boys, and they had a universal hit in Britain, Europe, and possibly here, I don't know, and they belong the Kingdom of Fife, a town called Dunfermline, which means the town on the hill, the Dun. And in their song, they mention Methil. And as far as I'm aware, it's the only time anybody anywhere in the world has ever mentioned my hometown. Any medium will tell you that it's a very strange life being a medium who works churches, serves churches, travels around. One minute you're standing up in front of a number of people and then perhaps 10, 20 minutes later you're on your own, going home, in the car, on the train, on the bus, forever. I use public transport in the UK. And several years ago, I'd been to a church in the city of Dundee. It was November, and I'm waiting on the train coming down from Aberdeen to take me home to Newcastle upon Tyne. And I live over the river there in Gateshead, which is a city of 200,000 people. And the number of people waiting in the cold and the dark was exactly two, me and a young girl. And she came over to me and she said, do you mind if I sit near you on the train because I don't like to travel on my own if I can avoid it in the dark. And you never know, sometimes people get drunk and come on the train and cause verbal abuse or worse. So I said, no, I certainly don't mind. 
and we started chatting. The train came in, we started chatting, and it turned out she's 21. And I asked her, well, where do you belong? And she said, well, I was born and brought up, and I still live in a town that you've probably never heard of <laughs> called Messel. <laughs> And I said, well, isn't that strange? And it turns out that she lives two streets away from where my parents used to live for 30 odd years. So it was, she wasn't just a young woman, she was an athlete. And she was taking part in the Paralympic Games eight years ago, this would have been. And she told me how God had given her a withered arm. She was born with her right arm, which was only about a foot long, 12 inches long. And she said, well, I could go around my life and moaning and complaining and feeling sorry for myself because I've only got a withered arm, but I'm going to make my left arm as strong as I can, and I'm going to learn how to throw the javelin. And she practiced that, and the reason she was up in Dundee was because she was there in college, getting on with her education. And she's number three in the British Paralympic team. And she said, well, I've been to Canada, I've been to New Zealand, I've been to South Africa, I've been all over the world with my one good arm throwing the javelin. And she was going to be taking part in the Paralympics, not the ones just gone, the ones before. And so I said, well, I'll promise to watch you. And she said, because I want to get to number one. And that Paralympic program came on one morning at 4 a.m. <laughs> but I did make a conscious effort to get up and I watched it. And she didn't get number one. She got number two. On the way on the train home, I said, how are you getting home? Because there's no railway in Methyl. It used to be until an idiot back in the 1960s decided to shut hundreds and hundreds of rail stations all over the UK and now you can't get around like you used to. That's called progress. <laughs> so she said, I get off at a place called Cooper and I drive myself home. And I said, pardon me to asking, but how do you drive yourself home? You've only got one arm. She said, it's easy. I drive myself using my knees. Because I've got a very special adapted car. And I thought, I'm not going to let a stupid thing like one arm stop me from driving. So she's learned how to drive herself to the station and home again at night using her knees. And she's got a boyfriend and apparently he's six foot tall, he's got a good job and he loves her. And he said to her, I couldn't care if he only had no arms, never mind one, I like you the person. I like you the spirit. I don't see you as a so-called cripple or a disabled person or a lesser human being. I see you as a manifestation of God's love who's got more courage in one left arm than millions of so-called normal people with two arms have. And before she left and got off the train, I said, I'll probably never see you again in my life. It's very unlikely. But I said, thanks for spending 20, 25 minutes with me on the train. And nowadays, 
when I was watching a bit of the Paralympics there a couple of months ago, I thought about her. And what I thought was, isn't God wonderful? God can uh, create us as an individual, and it's up to you and me what we make out of life. We can go through life moaning that we don't have this and we don't have that. I would like this and I would like that. But why don't we think about with love what God has given us and be glad for that? I would like to have perfect vision, but I have to use glass in front of my eyes. I would like to be able to walk for miles like I used to without having to use a stick to hang on to. I would like to think I can go through life without plastic in my mouth or mechanical <laughs> things in my heart or whatever it might be, but we aren't meant to be here for very long. If you live to be a hundred, you're a child of the universe. There's people been spirit for three million years. Human life goes back on this planet three million years. We found Viking remains in California who were here hundreds of years before Christopher Columbus, who was never called Christopher Columbus. His name is Cristobal Colon. We anglicized it years ago. Cristobal Colon in 1492 found the West Indies. And I'll just say to you finally the words of St. Augustine. Faith is believing in something you cannot see. I've got no doubt at all that the spirit world is real, although I can't see it with these eyes. I've got no doubt at all that love is real, which many of you will have experienced. So the reward is knowing and seeing that which other people cannot see. And thank you for listening this morning and may God bless you.